I think it's time to move on to another question. Our second question today, 30 minutes into the show. <laughs> well, what are you fucking, are you goddamn criticizing me? Is there somebody out there with a stopwatch listening to this motherfucker? I didn't get fucking 2.5 questions per minute. <laughs> well, every now and then, you know, someone sits there with a ticker and they let me know how many questions got on the air. But this one, Jim, is from James in South Manchester. Hello, James. Dear Jim, someone out there. I, I love to talk to Southern boys. You're from South Manchester. In England, yes. Yeah, Southern boy. It's a new way to think of it. But uh, dear Jim, <laughs> someone out there has helpfully compiled a comprehensive list of Dave Meltzer's minus starred matches. And I was <laughs> wondering how many of the 14 matches to receive a negative 3.5 star rating or worse have you actually seen? <laughs> the distinguished sack of festering turds includes the Ultimate Warrior vs. Hulk Hogan 2 at Halloween Havoc 98. Didn't see that. Mr. T vs. Roddy Piper boxing match, WrestleMania 2. I've seen that. Jenna Maraska vs. Charmel, TNA Victory Road 2000. I was there for that. And <laughs> <laughs> let me just stop you here. Put your finger in the spot so yeah. you won't lose it. Yeah. But <sighs> this... This is the only, you know, I, I like Jeff Jarrett. I like the whole Jarrett family. Everybody knows that. This is where I, I said a few things, but it was beyond my control. So I wasn't going to goddamn die on that hill. I just shook my fucking head. But whether it be that fucking disgusting fucking Pac-Man Jones piece of shit that brought his goddamn whole entourage of shitty fucking thugs with him, or whether it was that Jenna Maraska fucking cunt or whether it was all the other D list celebrities that they tried to get involved. That was the thing that I was most upset about because, and you should have seen the guys lined up to fucking shake Pac-Man Jones's hand and fucking put their armor. Cause they're all football fans. I didn't give a shit. All I knew was he was a disgraced football player. and had a shitty personal life was probably a shitty human being. And now he's on our show or take a fucking reality show. Fucking cunt. Or like that Johnny Fairplay. They used him. He's a, I had to fucking kick him out of a goddamn Ring of Honor parking lot in Greensboro one night because he was drunk. With, at intermission, I went outside to get some fucking air because it was 100 degrees in the building. And Johnny Fairplay comes up to me drunk asking why we won't book him. I said, because you're a fucking drunk and you're a fucking joke. And if you don't get away from me, I'll fucking tell you more. Sorry, Johnny, but you're a fucking drunk and you're a fucking joke and you didn't belong in a fucking wrestling business. These reality show TV stars, these goddamn D-list celebrities, these fucking disgraced goddamn NFL players and the rest of them, all it did was make the company look low rent and fucking cheap and goddamn desperate. Because who the fuck gives a shit about any of those people and why were they in wrestling? And then you have, and Charmel, bless her, Admitted that she didn't know really how to work, but she knew enough to get by because of being married to Booker and being around the business and, and having trained a little bit. But she wasn't the greatest worker in the world, but she looked like goddamn Chigusa Nagayo next to that fucking whoever the fuck that fucking cunt was from Survivor, Jenna Maraska. So, yes, I saw that and it was fucking embarrassing. And I walked away from the monitor and hid my head. That was one of those times in TNA when you go and because, you know, as a guy like fucking Russo. And by the way, hey, Vinny Rue, Merry Christmas. I'm still going to tell everybody what I think of your fucking piece of shit ass, regardless of your fucking EPO. Call the cops. Have them come to my house. I'll take pictures and I'll sell them. Russo was another guy who didn't want to be in wrestling. He's a big baseball fan. He likes other shit. He was embarrassed of the business he was in, and the business he was in was embarrassed because he was in it. And he liked that fucking shit, too, because he could get on TMZ or Jerry Springer or have his goddamn uh, uh, fucking trailer park trash mindset and lowest common denominator appeal to everything because he's a piece of shit and he he – books fucking wrestling not even wrestling he books fucking whatever he calls wrestling for pieces of shit that think like him and all this goddamn horse shit it's embarrassing it was embarrassing but he loved shit like that and and they did that in tna and i don't know why it just made him once again look like the fucking second rate b team next to the fuck because at least the wwe gets real stars of course, they're in the ring. They're not in the front row where they ought to be watching the wrestlers. That makes the wrestlers stars. They're in the ring 
doing better shit than the wrestlers do because they tell them to, and that makes the wrestlers look like idiots and makes the stars look like bigger stars. So it's opposite of the effect that you desire. But anyway, I digress. What's the rest of the fucking matches? Sid Vicious versus the Night Stalker from Clash of the Champions 13 in 1990. Oh, good Lord. I saw that too. And I still use the Night Stalker afterwards because <laughs> Brian, <laughs> Paul, Paul, well, no, Paul Orndorff recommended him and he would bring Paul up to the Smoky Mountain shows. And Brian was a hell of a young fucking talent and was getting over it. Just there was no leader there. You know, Sid couldn't lead it. Brian was too green to lead it. And it fucking, you know, it went in the toilet. And another one here on the list, Bobby Eaton and PN News versus Steve Austin and Terry Taylor in a scaffold match. Great American Bash 1991. There you go. And there's a classic example of regardless whether you have the best talent in the world. I've said it a million times. The greatest talent in the world can't overcome bad booking and the greatest booking in the world cannot make up for bad talent. This was a case of the first one. You have Steve Austin. You have Bobby Eaton. You have Terry Taylor, P and News was there, but they made it. People were used to the scaffold match that they'd seen with the Midnight Express. People are going to take bumps. People are going to be killed. You want to see the heels die. That's the whole uh, appeal of the scaffold match. And then they make, well, nobody's going to take a bump. We just need to capture a flag and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sure none of them wanted to be up there. And it was a throwaway fucking match. It drew nothing. It sold no tickets. And I'm not surprised it was the worst match, scaffold match and the worst match of, of any kind almost in history. But that's an example of a promotion booking a match where even the great, greatest wrestlers in the world and PN News could not make it acceptable. And James finishes his question here, Jim, by saying, what, in your opinion, is the absolute single worst match ever inflicted on the fans by a major <laughs> wrestling promotion discounting jobber matches. Okay. Well, I'm glad you said inflicted by a major promotion. Cause I was instantly going to say Dennis Corluzo versus Tommy. <laughs> <Pirro> in, <the laughs> in, in 1998 or whatever the fuck it was. Oh my God. The worst match ever, well, you know, and, and I would say it probably has happened in the last five or 10 years. And that means that I probably haven't seen it because I have not watched any major promotions nor many minor ones in the last five or 10 years. Um, I really, so I don't know what would be the absolute worst match uh, under those parameters. I remember I, I was over at Bolin's house one time a couple of years ago, and for some reason he still recorded SmackDown and Raw and all the stuff, and he insisted on making me watch this thing, and it was. Who's the black guy that looks like Cena? Darren Young. Okay, was he partners with Titus O'Neil? Yes. Okay. And they were wrestling two other guys on SmackDown. And he said, just watch this. And I'm watching the fucking thing. And all of a sudden, I think it was Titus O'Neil went to get a fucking hold on whoever he was working with and just completely blanked and he's trying to get the hold and he can't get the fucking hold and the guy doesn't know what he's trying to do <laughs> and all of a sudden you see the the fucking camera just leaves the ring and shoots the fucking stands and this was not a live show this was on tape and it shoots the stands for about 10 or 12 seconds and i'm thinking for a second there's going to be a run in yeah, because they're shooting and they're going to come down that. But no, it was just that he was going for a hold that he didn't know how to get. He didn't know what the hold was to begin with. He couldn't fucking get it. And I'm sure that Vince or somebody sitting at the gorilla position just said, shoot anything but this shit. So they just shot the crowd for like 10 seconds, just a static shot. And then they go back and, and Titus O'Neil has what would be termed, I guess, as an, a passable fucking hold on the guy in the ring, you know, but I mean, there's all, when you've got guys that are so green and they've, they've been in developmental for six months or they, they've never worked another territory and there are no territories to work and et cetera. I mean, it, it, people look at the matches now and go, Oh, the guy did the dive over the top and wow, this move. And they went, Holy shit. But I don't know that I've seen a lot of matches in the last several years that I would actually qualify as as great matches just simply because the guy's fundamentals are so fucking fucked. And, you know, and they don't even care to begin with because they just want to 
you know, do the, the big spots and stuff, but I, I can't say what's the absolute worst, but there was a hell of a fucking list. You just, you just made there. 